All right, let's get started. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this Ask the Experts webinar. I'm Allison Phillips, Director of Marketing on Cox Media's corporate team, and I'll be your host. A quick housekeeping item before I introduce our guest expert. This presentation is being recorded. You'll receive an email with the recording so you can watch it again at your convenience or share it with your teams. We have about 45 minutes of great content for you and 10 minutes or so set aside for Q&A. But if at any time during today's presentation you have a question, just go ahead and type it into the question box on your screen and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. All right, so now that that's out of the way, I'm so excited to introduce you to today's guest expert, Alex Fleshner. Alex is a group manager of strategic accounts at Google, and during his seven plus years there, he has mastered the privacy landscape across several sectors, including hospitality, healthcare, and automotive, among others. If you've ever found yourself wondering why an ad you were trying to run was rejected, or you're simply just trying to keep up with the ever evolving ad policies from companies like Facebook, Amazon, and Google, you're not alone. In this session, Alex is gonna walk us through why these policies are there to begin with and what you can do to ensure your ads run smoothly and effectively on sites like Google. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Alex. Thank you, Allison. Um, I just want to start off by extending a thank you to the Cox team for thinking of me today for today's presentation and a warm welcome to all of you for attending. At Google, we always start our meetings off with a little icebreaker, so I figured I'd open with some animations to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a Los Angeles native. I attended NYU for both my undergraduate and MBA studies with a major in sports management, actually. Um, we'll get to that in a second. And my passion in life is chasing solar eclipses. I've been fortunate enough to witness uh, six to date, with the most recent being in Yellowstone in 2019. If you haven't seen a solar eclipse, be on the lookout in 2024. The next one is crossing over the southern United States down through Texas um, and, and closer to Alabama. So definitely be on the lookout. So why am I here today? I've been working at Google, as Allison alluded to, for over seven years now. I started our policy team. I've led teams within our agency ads business. But I'm more interested in this topic because I had to navigate the Google ads ecosystem myself when I started my own company after college. One of the businesses I co-founded was, was in the daily fantasy sports space, which we'll touch upon a little bit later. The other icebreaker question I always love to open up with, and please feel free to type in the chat box if you dare or if you're feeling like it, um, is the first concert you ever attended. I used to give away my age with my answer, but I've started to now realize as I attend more and more meetings that I don't know any of the new TikTok stars or any of the new artists or rappers um, that are starting to become mentioned. Uh, for the record, mine was the Backstreet Boys uh, back at the Great Western Forum several, several years ago. So feel free to, to chime in, in the chat box, but uh, that is my POV. So over the course of my life, um, there's been many rules and warnings I've been given. And I think the two that have stuck with me the most are the following. First, Stay away from politics when you first meet someone. And two, don't use too much text in presentations. And I'm happy to say that today, I'm gonna to be breaking both of those rules. Policy conversations aren't always the most, let's say, exciting topic to cover. So as much as I missed in-person meetings, the best part about pre presenting on Zoom is that I won't be able to tell if half of you fall asleep during my talk. All jokes aside, there will be a lot of text, so please bear with me as I try to cover the highlights and what might matter most to your businesses. Here's what we'll be covering today. First, an overview of Google's policy landscape. It's important, it's important to know how it works behind the scenes. Second, we'll cover the various types of disapprovals you might run into on your account and how you can approach those specific disapprovals. Third, we're gonna have a vertical specific conversation across four key verticals, um, which many of the attendees represent. And then lastly, we're gonna cap off with some quick tips and tricks uh, to help you troubleshoot some of these violations. Sound good? All right, let's do it. 
So I said it was talking politics, uh, which is true, but might have been somewhat of a stretch. We're going to be chatting about Google policy today, but I wanted to start the presentation off with a more high level discussion that is facing the broader digital advertising landscape. This can be an entire session in itself, but technology companies and government agencies have been moving to a more privacy centric world in which major platforms are reworking the way their ad units and data collection frameworks function. These changes can have significant impact on your marketing mix. So please make sure you're working with the Cox team and you're following along as developments progress in the space. Okay, that was a quick detour, but onward to Google Ads policy, the main point of focus for our discussion today. Google Ads policies are designed to create a safe experience for users, prohibit ads that are going to be harmful to the digital ecosystem, and ensure a safe playing field across the board. At the end of the day, the way to think about it is that Google's policies are all centered around user protection, whether it's discussions surrounding topics to allow or disallow, ad types to reject, and websites that might or might not comply with our policy, Google's core tenant all surrounds user protection. So it's a given that as a Google guy, I've got some nerd in me. So it's only right that we include some numbers in the presentation and hopefully these help paint a picture of what the policy landscape looks like from the Google ecosystem. Several numbers up here on the screen. Um, we haven't even gotten to the text heavy part yet that I promised, so, so bear with me. But Google continues to fight against bad actors looking for new ways to take advantage of people online. In 2020 alone, just to give you a sense of scale and scope, Google added or updated more than 40 policies for advertisers and publisher websites. The platform also blocked or removed 3.1 billion ads for violating policies and restricted an additional 6.4 billion ads. So when we're thinking about the breadth and depth of the Google policy and what it might cover, there's a lot that goes into this. So as I alluded to beforehand, taking a quick look under the hood to help demonstrate how Google can handle that scale um, is extremely important. And a core tenant of that oversight and those regulations all comes down to machine learning as it's required to train the system to function and operate properly. So just to give you a quick overview about how these policy frameworks work is that the first step, or at least the core tenant, is that experts and technology are working together around the clock, so 24 seven, to improve the practice and the policy surrounding our ads. Secondly, algorithms are then built based on human knowledge that's being inputted into our system. Google basically has human reviewers who identify policy that are violating ads, and the engineers on the Google side use these examples to train the model in terms of what are similar ads and what falls outside of this scope. And that collaboration between human and machine helps Google make leaps in terms of improving the safety within the ads ecosystem. And this feedback loop is ever changing. And I think the point or the key takeaway is that policy is always adopting and it's always adapting towards what the current landscape looks like and new implementations uh, that happen on a more macro level. And I wanted to provide a quick example. Um, I won't go too heavy into the text here, but in 2020, in 2020, as we all know, the world was hit by COVID and Google was faced with an entirely new realm that it would never had dealt with before. And the way that Google approached this was in a few key ways. A, it introduced new policies and programs, including advertiser identity verification and business operation ver verification programs. Secondly, it invested in technology to better detect coordinated um, adversarial behavior, allowing Google to connect the dots across all accounts and suspend multiple bad actors at once. The biggest issue that we experienced uh, during COVID was with our mask policy, as well as PPE in terms of some advertisers have been taking advantage of it. So Google needed to act on the fly and make sure that they were shutting down any bad policies or any bad actors in the moment and on the fly. All right, 
So we've got the one on the 101 in terms of how the Google policy machine functions and the scale that it must oversee. So let's get into the specifics a little bit. There's three core buckets for what policy impacts can look like. The first are ad disapprovals. The second are account suspensions. And the third are account holds or pauses. And I'll talk a little bit about what the difference is between all three buckets. First and foremost, ad disapprovals are specifically placed on creatives that might be running in your account, creatives or ads. In other words, in other words it would just be specific creative or a few creatives within the broader account that might be disapproved based on the content within. And we'll get into more specific around what that might look like shortly. An account pause or an account hold is essentially when Google requires more information from an advertiser and the platform will temporarily suspend all of the ads or the account at large from serving any ads until that verification or request, or request for more information is filled. And then lastly, there's an account suspension. And this is the most uh, serious threat, I would say, to an advertiser's account. Some suspension types will provide a warning period, um, typically for about seven days before a permanent ban is placed into gear. And during those seven days, the advertiser does have the ability to correct any potential issues, send over information to Google to make sure that it's not incorrectly suspended, and to ensure that the account does function smoothly, smoothly if this is an over flag or an oversight. The more egregious violations uh, those are permanent bans. And if it's egregious enough, the account will immediately go dark and no ads will be serving. And essentially it's extremely hard to get that account reactivated. So to know if your account is suspended or not, you'll typically get an email from Google Ads Policy, but then there's also a red banner at the top of your account indicating that there is a suspension and what the cause actually was. So when we think about Google Ads policy across ad and account level, there's four categories in which policy might impact your account. The first is content that's completely prohibited. An example of that would be marijuana. Google to date, um, you know, depending on where, where some of the macro uh, legal framework and some of the states tend to head, uh, is completely banning marijuana. That's just one example of if your ad or your account or your website is advertising marijuana, you will be completely flagged and pretty much not allowed to run on the platform. I'll get into a few more examples on the next few slides. The second is prohibited practices. This is when an advertiser demonstrates shady or unethical business practices, which the Google algorithms will flag. Third is restricted content. More on this later, but categories which might be a bit more sensitive in nature, but not necessarily completely banned. So Google has allowed these advertisers within these verticals or within these content to advertise. However, there's a bit more oversight in terms of what certifications you might need and the review process in which Google requires for these clients. And lastly, editorial. Uh, for example, and these are typically more on the less egregious side, an example would be an ad containing an exclamation mark in which Google will require you as the advertiser to remove based on Google's editorial requirements. Um, again, there's some resources that we'll share a little bit later in this presentation just for a frame of reference. So here's the examples specifically that you might encounter on the ad level. We're not talking about the account. This would be creative specific in terms of where you have the ability to make sure you can go in, you can edit, you can comply with the policy, and we can resubmit for a review. I'm not gonna go into each policy in particular. Uh, please feel free to ask me about any of these uh, in the chat box or towards the Q&A session if you are particularly interested in learning more. But as you can see, the policies run the gamut of the four buckets. One example I'll give is dangerous products. Google's got a restriction, yes, on marijuana, but other categories that Google's basically got a hard no-go on are guns. So if your website, if your ad or your landing page advertises for guns as an example, 
Google will disapprove those ads immediately. So just make sure when we're thinking through what frameworks are and aren't allowed, um, consider the Google Ads Policy Help Center just to identify which categories are and are not allowed. And we'll get into specific categories again in the next, uh, in the next section here. And then let's look at the account level. Uh, again, it runs the gamut in terms of what types of violations those might be. And these, remember, are going to be the more uh, egregious violations that will impact the account level. Um, I'll, I'll hammer into two of these. The first, circumventing systems. Um, as an example, and I've dealt with this before, there are some advertisers who have two accounts running at the same time because they believe they can game the option and they believe that they can take over more of the Google Home screen just by opening two separate accounts, thinking that they might be able to circumvent the system. If you are caught setting up two accounts or if there's one uh, advertiser leveraging both customer IDs, that's where you might see a suspension on your account as an egregious violation. The other less, I would say, egregious, but important to note are billing issues. Those are extremely important to stay on top of. So as you launch your Google Ads campaigns, whether you're using a credit card or you're leveraging invoicing, just make sure you're staying on top of that because delays in billing payments can also lead to account level suspensions. And as promised, uh, there is a single source of truth for all information related to Google Ads policies, and that's the Help Center. Um, so take a look through there. This is linked out and we'll send it over afterwards. But from a high level understanding of what types of policies are and are not allowed, uh, the Help Center is a great resource or a great forum to make sure that you can understand what the gamut looks like. All right, so we're moving over into vertical specific considerations. And I'd love to get a pulse from the room. Uh, feel free to, to chat in the chat box. Um, it also helps me just to make sure that people are still with me. But if you can type in the chat box, the vertical or the business line you operate within, I'd love to get an understanding of who we actually have in the room today. I'll give it a few seconds here. Um, please feel free to chime in. I'm not sure if I'll be able to see all the chats that come through, but would love to get a sense of, of the industries that we've got and you know, start identifying the type of questions I'll probably be stumped with towards the end of my talk. I did prepare four high-level categories, so let's, let's just jump in there. I'm going to start with healthcare. Healthcare is considered one of those sensitive or restricted categories that I had mentioned at the outset of the talk, meaning a certificate might or might not be required based on what you are promoting. By the way, I warned you about the text, so bear with me. I wanted to ensure all information was provided, but I'm going to touch on just a few for today. Again, if you have any specific questions in the Q&A about anything within these verticals, please do feel free to submit that in the Q&A box uh, for the end of, of today's conversation. Linked on this slide and all the subsequent slides for the different categories that we'll be covering, are linked to certificates that Google requires, or in some instances, you don't necessarily need one based on um, what we're outlining here. But Google does require specific certifications or applications if you fall within certain categories. And within the healthcare space, there's several that you can see on the left-hand side. Those that are pharmaceutical linked industries specifically tend to have the most restriction or oversight in terms of ensuring that you can successfully advertise with Google. As you can see here, LegitScript, um, if any of you are familiar or operate within the pharmaceutical space, LegitScript is a third party company that Google has contracted with to help with verification. So if your pharma drug is not listed or approved by LegitScript, Google will not approve your ads on the platform. Another interesting area to dig into are clinical trials. Those are also tend to be pharmaceutically linked so what you'll need to work through is submitting an application with Google for a certification, explaining the ramifications of the trial, what types of drugs you'll be testing, and what the parameters or frameworks look like within the clinical trial content. Another one I wanted to highlight is health insurance. Health insurance not only requires that Google certificate we talked about, that's incorporating your URL and some basic information about the insurance that you cover, 
but it does also require third-party certification, just as an aside. So when you're thinking about which category you fall within, please take a look here. My understanding as well is that we do have many attendees on this call who fall within verticals on the right-hand side, where there's no cert certification required. Hospitals, individual doctors, urgent care clinics. What's nice about these frameworks or categories is that there's not as much oversight that Google requires to get you up and running with the platform. So please take a look through here. Um, I've worked with several hospitals and several doctors, um, and there's not too much restriction when it comes to those specific aspects of the overall healthcare business. The one thing that you do wanna make sure that we're keeping in mind, and this was introduced as a result of some of those COVID uh, bad actors that we, had, that we had spoken about beforehand, there is COVID certification required if you are bidding on COVID related terms. So if you're targeting your ads based on COVID related keywords or queries, you will need to take that extra step. Uh, you can find this on the Help Center as well as linked below to fill out a COVID authorization form for your account to be whitelisted. And then lastly, I think this is important across all the different categories that we'll be covering. Um, the categorization of your website, and we alluded to this beforehand, is based on both your ad content as well as the landing page that you're driving to. So if your ad leads to a specific destination, just one page of your website, it's gonna be that page that's most scrutinized as falling within one of these um, categories. So if you do have pharmaceutical aspects on various different subdomains on your site, please ensure that you are following or abiding by those policies and submitting accordingly. All right, so if you all were listening at the outset and you're still with me, I promised I would tie my daily fantasy sports company back in here. So I'll allude to that or I'll touch on that briefly. And my understanding is that a majority of those attendees within this space are involved with brick and mortar casinos or casino hotels. So we'll also touch on that. So there's four different categories in terms of where gambling and gambling related games might fall. Online non-casino games, online gambling, offline gambling, or social games. And I'll get into these uh, a little bit more specifically since it's a very important policy to cover and there are very specific requirements to ensure that your website doesn't get flagged and that your ads are approved. When we're talking about online non-casino games, the only non-casino game that is currently approved by Google are daily fantasy sports. Um, it's, it's an industry that's, that's booming right now. Um, if there are those on the line who uh, have questions about it or want to chat, chat afterwards about my experience in this space, I'd always love to um, speak with you all and, and, and shoot the shit. But essentially, the requirements are very specific. A, you must apply for a certification. Some states require a licensor to attach their DFS or their daily fantasy license. So if you are within this space, please ensure that you're submitting this information to Google ahead of when you need to launch your ads. Secondly, you cannot target minors. Pretty straightforward with the national gambling policy, but Google does abide with that as well. There must be a disclaimer, again, on the landing page. So where your ad is sending traffic, there must be a disclaimer to explain the service with the age parameters that you can cater to. Lastly, well, two points here. A, there must be information for gambling addiction in the ad or the landing page. So either or, but there must be that disclosure um, as prevalent and common across other platforms as well. And lastly, there cannot be an affiliation with a school or a university. Let's move on to potentially maybe more of the, the sweet spot for where some of the attendees fall. Online gambling. So there's very specific country rules. Um, and the United States is definitely one of the most liberal in terms of allowing online gambling across horse racing, sports betting, and online casinos. They're all allowed. However, again, there are very uh, specific requirements to make sure that you can abide by Google's policy and not get flagged by the system. First, you have to apply for certification. The form is linked here on this slide. Second, you cannot target anybody under 21. 
as is the case for online gambling as opposed to daily fantasy sports. And you can also not target outside of anywhere where you're certified. If you are licensed in these, in these locales, it typically will um, let you know that or, or present that in their disclaimers and in their agreements with the license. But Google also makes sure to enforce that as well. And again, as with daily fantasy sports, you must have a disclaimer in the landing page or within the ad creative itself. And then lastly, offline gambling. And offline gambling um, are casino, standalone casinos, as well as casino hotels. Brick and mortar casinos or the casino hotels are eligible to run with Google, and there's no certification required in the United States. The difference between online and offline gambling is that offline gambling is less restrictive than online gambling. So an important point to note, um, as well as ensuring that you are abiding by some of those policies moving forward. There are targeting parameters um, outside of just editorial and policy, targeting parameters around what you can and can't do across YouTube as an example within gambling. Um, and that would probably be a, a webinar in itself. But for the most part, um, offline gambling, less restrictive, online gambling, a little bit more restrictive, just as a key takeaway here. And then as we move into our last two verticals to cover, financial products and recruitment, those are coming up. It's important to highlight a major change that Google introduced in October of last year. To protect users from biased or discriminatory practices, Google restricted targeting for companies who are within the three bolded categories. And as a result, and as depicted on the next slide, certain targeting criteria are not allowed within Google Ads if you fall within these three categories. And a few of those targeting criteria involve gender, age, marital status, and zip code. This might be hard on the eyes, so bear with me. But here is a broad list of what is and isn't allowed within the housing, employment, and credit space. So as we're talking about these next few categories, um, please make sure that you keep these back in mind this is all listed within the Help Center, but important to note, um, not only from an editorial ad content perspective, but when you're thinking about how you can target your ads to very specific types of users, uh, there are very specific restrictions that have been introduced by Google, as well as other ad platforms that have moved to uh, reduce bias in the space. So that was targeting. Let's talk a little bit about content. Here's what's required across the three highlighted aspects of the financial services industries. Within, within personal loans, landing page requirements are very specific. First, minimum and maximum repayment periods must be listed on the website, on the landing page. And please keep in mind, again, this is all about the landing page. So if a user clicks on your ad and they get taken to our URL, that is the landing page where these requirements are necessary. Next, a maximum APR must be listed. Uh, that would be the interest rate plus fees and other costs, whatever other costs you associate with a client or with your business. Next, again, this is uh, somewhat rep repetitive and redundant, but you must have a representative example of the total cost of the loan. Again, inclusive of fees, but you actually must list out an example of what that would look like. And lastly, there are restrictions and quite frankly, prohibitions around a business who requires a full, full, a full payback within 60 days. So if your business falls within that category, Google will be very strict in terms of what the repayment terms are. So please make sure that you follow those four bullets um, if you fall within this space and if your business operates within this category. Let's move over to, to credit repair. Credit repair services are not allowed. However, there are a few different types of credit related businesses that Google does permit. A, financial instruments. Uh, a few examples are listed here, but even if it's a, uh, advertised as improving one's credit score, as long as it's a financial instrument, it is permissible. Secondly, credit monitoring services. Credit counseling or bankruptcy services are all allowed. I won't go through all of these, but the other piece to highlight are also B2B services. 
So we've talked about B2C, um, some of the restrictions there. Business to business services, including debt collection services or credit repair for businesses are allowed. So credit repair for a personal individual consumer restricted. If it's for a business itself, that's where you are allowed to operate within the confines of the framework. And then lastly, uh, financial advisors, somewhat broad. Um, you must ensure two specific areas on your landing page to comply with policy. First, make sure that all of your contact information is present on the landing page. That includes your address, your phone number, and your email. Google does a pretty rigorous verification process within this space to ensure that the businesses that are advertising are in fact what they are, what they are advertising themselves as. And as with some of the other areas as well, make sure there's a disclosure on what your service fee looks like. So if you do tack on a percentage or a flat fee, please make sure that that is apparent and visible on your landing page. All right, the last vertical that we're gonna cover here is recruitment. We talked a little bit about what the changes were that Google made on the targeting aspect of things within the recruitment space but there are specific areas within recruitment that fall within that scope or are restricted. And then there are some of those that fall outside of that scope and are not targeting restricted. A few examples are listed here, whether they're job search databases, freelance or gig job listings, services for job seekers or job recruitment services. Those are the areas that have the targeting restricted. So again, can't target by age, can't target by gender, can't target by marital status. However, within the recruitment space, there are a few areas that don't have those restrictions associated with them. Career advice, networking services, employment training, and application management. So when you think about the categorization of your business, please make sure you're consulting with your agency, as well as using your best judgment in terms of which category you fall within. I will say if you do, fall within kind of a gray area, please feel free to give Google support a call and they can help you hash that out in terms of what classification you might be. All right, last piece of our conversation today is gonna to focus around troubleshooting. In other words, what do you do if you're hit with one of these policies on the account level or the ad level? And we'll jump into that here. This part uh, definitely seems complicated, but I'll, I'll try to clear it up for you all. Essentially, every time you create an ad or an account, there's a very similar process or it follows a very specific process. A, the account and the ads go under review and they're deemed as four different categories. The ads themselves are either eligible, eligible limited, disapproved, or you'll get a notification for contact us. Eligible means your ads are good to go. You pass off our policy checks. Your ad will start to run within a matter of 24 hours, typically. Eligible limited, that would be some of those ads that fall within these sensitive categories that we referred to. So if you had submitted your certifications, um, if you are within a healthcare space, for example, your ad will show as eligible limited, but make sure that you understand that they're still serving right? They just have specific limitations in terms of the reach that they might have based on the category that they fall within. As an example, gambling, if your ads are eligible limited, it basically just means that you're not going to be serving to users that are over, or sorry, that are under 21 years old. There are some instances where your ad will get disapproved. And there's, I guess, three different areas that you might want to think about here. A, your ad's disapproved and it's just not going to serve and you've basically thrown in the towel and said, you know what, I shouldn't be running, I can't run my ad. Secondly, if you've identified what the fix is or if you think it's an easy fix, as I mentioned before, some fixes are extremely straightforward, like editorial policy. So if you had an exclamation mark in your ad and Google uh, disapproved it, take out the exclamation point, submit the ad again, and you should be back up and running within 24 to 48 hours. Lastly, there's a dispute decision option or an option to appeal a dis disapproved ad. So there are instances, not everybody's perfect, even though we think, I think machines are, are starting to become smarter than humans. There are instances where the machine might over flag your ad. And if you believe that you've been over flagged, you have the ability within this, the system to appeal the, to appeal the ruling. So if you've 
complied with all policy, if you've double checked your editorial, if you've made sure that there's nothing on the landing page that might trigger that, feel free to go ahead and dispute that decision and it'll automatically be sent to our review team for a human to take a look and make sure whether the disapproval was accurate or incorrect. Lastly, if your ads are stuck under review for more than two full business days or more than 48 hours, give the support team a call. There's a link in there to, um, to chat, to email, and even to call the, the support line directly, just in case you need some help expediting that review. So if your account gets suspended, again, there are very specific areas in terms of where your account might, might be suspended and where Google might require you to be accurate or to submit an appeal. First and foremost, identify what policy is being flagged for on your account. That'll typically be listed in that red bar that I alluded to beforehand on the top of your screen. And once you've identified what that issue is, please make sure you're just complying again with your agency or with your in-house teams to make sure that all of those requirements are met before you appeal the decision. Lastly, once you've felt like you've made all the changes and your, your website is good to go, your landing page is good to go, as well as your ad creatives, there's a form that you can fill out to essentially let Google know, hey, I'm ready for this review. Please make sure that you're giving my account the time of day and the, the tender love and care that it deserves. Uh, within typically within 48 to 36 hours, 36 to 48 hours, you'll hear back from our internal teams whether the changes that you made complied with our policy, whether the changes that you've made are permanently not going to go through, or whether there's a little bit more information that the Google team requires in order to get you back up and running. Here's a few examples of information you can share. I'll go through these quickly. Um, information reg regarding the business or the advertisement. There's some cases where you might need to better provide your business model. Um, I know I spoke a little bit about this on the financial side of things. If there's a service fee that you haven't clearly identified or it's not clearly listed on the website, Google will just ask you for that. If there's a context in terms of why you're advertising, they might just give, they might ask for that as well to identify, are you looking to grow your share within the local market or are there alternative reasons in terms of why you opened your ad account? Um, one other I'll touch upon is proof of payment. There's a lot of instances that I've seen where accounts have gone suspended or they've been paused due to Google not receiving a payment from our advertisers. And in a lot of instances, those payments had been made. They just not, they had not reached the Google headquarters yet. In some of those instances, you're able to expedite or get the account, the, the account hold removed. If you can send a proof of payment, whether it's the wire payment that you've sent, a screenshot from your credit card company showcasing that the payments were made, That'll essentially help you um, boost the account back into spend and remove that pause or that hold on the account. There are several other policies here, um, and for the sake of time, I'll probably just cover these high level. And I know I alluded to this earlier, but on the account level, again, there's a gamut of uh, violations that Google considers egregious. Uh, I think one of the more obvious ones are counterfeit goods. If there are reviews about your company uh, where users are basically submitting complaints about the quality of your products or if they're not genuine products. Google's going to take that to heart and essentially take a look through or pretty much immediately place your account under review or under suspension. In those instances, you'll need to submit uh, the best case in terms of where you get your products from, the manufacturer, or so on and so forth. Another example would be of using the, the ad network. Cloaking is typically the largest um, infraction or egregious activity that I've typically seen. And that's basically advertisers who are fronting as one thing and potentially are a completely different business on the back end. As an example, I used to work with a client that actually made it seem like they were selling books. And when a user clicked on their ad, they were taken to a website where there was a fake inventory of books and they were collecting user data and selling that off. They weren't a book business whatsoever. So please just make sure, again, as you're operating within these frameworks, um, take a look through here. You'll know where Google is suspending the account, why they're suspending the account. And giving it your best effort and providing as much information as possible is key to getting your account back up and running. Here's just one last piece on the misrepresentation side. Um, the, the best way to sum this up is clickbaiting. Um, there have been some clients or advertisers that have essentially um, promised one thing in their ads and have completely 
um, not delivered when, once you've gotten to their site, whether it's a different price that's being advertised or different promotion or sweepstakes, whatever it might be. Again, just one other example of where Google might consider an egregious violation. So we've gone through a lot today, um, and I appreciate all those who have stuck with me um, and who have engaged in some of the conversation here. The takeaway is that there is a lot to comprehend and a lot to learn. And the best way to navigate forward and during my days of, of starting my own company, the way that I approached policy was just getting a sense of what the framework looks like, getting familiar with the requirements that were within my space and identifying the sources that I could turn to just in case there were issues, whether that's your agency, whether that's your in-house team, or even just a self-service appeal, having all of that at your disposal is extremely helpful to making sure that you've got a successful launch and a su successful account. So with that, I'll pass it back to Allison uh, to see if there's any questions from the audience. Yes. Um, first off, thanks, Alex. And and thank you all for your participation throughout the presentation. Uh, we saw your comments on our end, but we know you couldn't see each other's responses. Um, but it sounds like we have some attendees who had some pretty epic first concerts, um, including Elton John and Kiss, just to name a couple. Um, I'm very jealous. Um, and we have folks on the call from so many different industries, from transportation to home services, um, education, legal um, and many more so it's great to have so many different industries represented um, and we do have a few minutes for some questions so um, i know we've had a few come in while you were talking alex and we'll get to those in just a second um, but if anyone else has a question you'd like to go ahead and ask alex just submit it through the same question box you've been using to engage throughout the presentation all right um, before we get into some of the questions that have already been submitted i have a question for you alex um, so how long does the ad review process typically take once an advertiser does submit an appeal after, you know, maybe their accounts been submitted? Yeah, um, good question, Allison. It, it will vary in some instances. There are some reviews that are much quicker than others. The typical time frame that I would expect for a turnaround would be two days. Um, if your ad is stuck under review for more than two days, please make sure that you are submitting that escalation form um, to make sure that Google does get a reviewer to take action on it. Um, always better to be more aggressive than sit behind the wheel, so to speak. So typically to answer your question, it's about 48, within 48 hours. I've typically seen a lot of the, the more straightforward ad approvals happen within five to six hours. Wow, that's awesome, thank you. Um, one of the first questions we got, um, I think you kind of answered it as you uh, went through the presentation, but um, you mentioned earlier on that um, accounts can get suspended when there are multiple accounts operating under the same company. Um, so kind of, I think the term was circumventing the system is what you said. Um, so when something like that happens, if the advertiser maybe wasn't aware of that, um, you know, policy and was doing it in good faith, um, how can they rectify the situation? But also, what does it look like or how are they notified? Um, you know, why the account was suspended and, and in that notification, does it include ways that they can solve the issue? Yeah, so I've, I've run into this beforehand where uh, there might be a client who had been with another agency or somebody at their account prior to them joining had created another Google Ads account that they were not aware of. Um, that's where the appeal process comes into play. The notification on the account will typically either say, you know, account suspended, or it'll give you a little bit more specifics in terms of why and ask you for um, information to submit. But my best advice, if you are suspended for that policy, is to document as much as possible. And I can't stress that enough. I mean, send as much information as you can, whether there was an old employee who created it, um, or if you have proof that you have access to the other account and you are just a new employee, anything along those lines will help your case to make sure that the Google support team, and these are, these are going to be human reviewers, not the machine learning algorithm, right? These will be human reviewers who are going to be activating on this on a case-by-case -case basis. So my, my broad answer there is submit as much information as possible, provide dates and screenshots where necessary, um, and, you know, 
depending on what the policy looks like or the policy that's been flagged, um, you know, submitting accurate information will be extremely helpful to get that overturned. On a similar thread, um, what about businesses with multiple locations who maybe operate semi independently? So I think about like automotive dealerships who maybe have three or four rooftops and have their own marketing budget per location. Um, do all of those need to operate under a single Google account or can they operate separately? As long as somewhat of a of a intricate question. So a few different things to consider. A, if the URLs are different, right? If you're sending to a different landing page, um, so uh, car dealer Georgia versus car dealer Florida.com, those are totally acceptable to have separate accounts. If they are the same landing page, but are just targeting different locations and have separate budgets, my best recommendation, even from a strategy perspective, is to keep that all within one account, right? So having a campaign geared towards one specific location with its own budget, and then campaign B for that other specific locale with its own budget, that's typically how I would recommend the setup. Don't quote me on this, but if you for some reason needed to have separate accounts for the same dealership, as long as you're submitting the information to Google about why you've got two separate accounts, whether it's two different credit cards that you need for each location or whatever it might be, as long as that's clearly outlined, Google will be receptive to that information. I will say it's better to be on the safe side because you know I understand how important it is for your ads to be up and running 24 seven. So any um, disruption to the ad serving might be a challenge. So something to just consider. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, we have a question about Google reviews. Um, so um, this advertiser has had um, a bad review from someone who's never done business with them. Um, and this is something we all struggle with, right? Um, how can I get that removed? Um, it sounds like we've tried the Google Appeals policy and haven't gotten anywhere. So what is what advice would you give to someone who um, runs into a situation, situation like that? Yeah, those are always tough. I, I had to deal with those back in back in the day as well. Um, those are those are never fun, especially when they're unwarranted. Um, there's two approaches I, I, I would take here. Um, it seems like you know the escalation path has already gone has already been gone through. Um, I would say that a flagging this issue again with your agency um, or continuing to submit that with the Google review team um, is extremely important. And again, just showcasing what the review was, um, if there was an interaction with this client, and why it might potentially be unwarranted. The second, and I, I'm more on the Google ad side, but I think my, my best advice that I've worked with clients on for Google reviews are, it's always important to respond back to a user, right? If they've had a bad experience, responding back, explaining, you know, expressing your, um, you know, for, for forgiving, right? Understanding why did they have a bad experience and expressing that you want to make it up to them always goes a long way too. So even if you can showcase to Google as an example in your escalation that you've responded, either you haven't gotten a reply or you know this might've just been a, a bad actor who just wanted to diminish your brand name, that can go a long way too. So I think it's about active review management as well as you know continuing to escalate that to the Google support channels with more evidence that you've tried to rectify the scenario. All right, we have we have a lot of questions for you, Alex. Um, so the next one is um, kind of about how these policies apply to out of country advertisers. So um, are these policies global? Are they limited to advertisers in the U.S.? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so I know for today's conversation. Um, I wanted to focus it on the United States specifically because we could we could probably speak for 10 hours about all the different ramifications across each country and I'm, and I'm sure that you all are almost done with my voice. But the answer to that question is it depends on the category. Um, as I mentioned or alluded to in the, in, the, in the presentation as an example, gambling is very liberal here in the US as an example, but if you looked at other 
countries or other territories that might be a lot more restrictive within their gambling rules, just even on a national level, on a macro level, you'll find that those are a lot more restrictive. Another example, just to kind of classify why I think it depends, is if you think about the pharmaceutical space, right? There's various different pharmaceutical manufacturers here in the US and different drugs, quite frankly, that are allowed and not allowed, versus even in Canada over the border, it could be completely different. So again, it's not the best answer, but I would say that use the Google Help Center as your best friend, because it will list out for every single uh, country and even down to the state level, if there's state specific rules, what those policies look like, what's allowed and what's not allowed, and if there are specific certifications that might be required. Today's conversation was really geared towards the US, uh, but that's a really good question because it does differ across every, pretty much every country uh, that you navigate to. All right, you mentioned earlier in the presentation um, some targeting restrictions in certain categories. Um, so we got a follow-up question. I think that's just looking for a little bit more detail there on um, why is housing and employment um, particularly not allowed to use life events uh, or gender as targeting criteria? Yeah, great question. So this was as part of an effort, um, again, last year where, and, and I believe this is also um, the case for other platforms, um, some of the, the Facebook platforms um, and some of the others out there that wanted to crack down on discriminatory practices within housing, employment, um, and credit. And this is part of a, again, I, a lot of the policies are in relation to maybe national crackdowns or macroeconomic policy. But to answer that question specifically, it was because these platforms made a concerted effort that they didn't want to provide advertisers with any potential avenue to either racially um, discriminate, right? Any, any type of discrimination based on these specific categories where there in the past had potentially been some discriminatory practices. So Google felt like it was their responsibility to crack down on this and not allow advertisers in those spaces to be able to target based on those specific criteria. Makes sense. Can't get off mute today. Um, thanks, Alex. All right. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, we had some great questions that we didn't get to. Um, what we'll do is we will follow up with Alex with some of those questions and see if we can get a blog article maybe out of them. Um, and we will publish that to our blog um, and make sure all of you have access um, to the questions we didn't get to. So um, as a quick reminder, a recording of our webinar today will be emailed to you and we will be back early next year. Hard to believe that we're almost at the end of this year, but we will be back early next year with another guest expert and some more great content. So we hope you'll be able to join us again then. Um, in the meantime, check out our blog for articles, ebooks, and uh, recordings of some of our previous Ask the Experts webinars. And as always, for any additional questions regarding today's content, please contact your Cox Media consultant. And if you're not a current customer, visit coxmedia.com to connect with one of our media experts. So thank you all again, and thank you, Alex, for, for sharing your insights with us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all again next time. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.